Hello, I'm Sebastian Michael, and this is This Saturday's Sonnet. Those lips that love's own hand did make, breathed forth the sound that said, I hate, to me that languished for her sake. But when she saw my woeful state, straight in her heart did mercy come, chiding that tongue that ever sweet was used in giving gentle doom, and taught it thus anew to greet. I hate she altered with an end that followed it as gentle day doth follow night who like a fiend from heaven to hell is flown away. I hate from hate away she threw and saved my life saying not you. And this is the exceptional, extraordinary and unique it's genuinely unique, sonnet 145. It's an oddity in the canon of sonnets because of whom it is most likely addressed to, because of its format, the verse in which it is written, and also because it's probably the one that scholars who know about these sonnets seem to argue most about whether it is any good or not. I frankly don't quite see that, but I maybe this is a good point for me to reiterate that I am not a Shakespeare scholar. I'm somebody who deeply loves these sonnets. I'm somebody who has spent a year now, more or less exactly, studying these sonnets and going to some depth, trying to understand them. But I'm not somebody who has academically studied William Shakespeare or his sonnets. And so it baffles and bemuses me a little bit that there is so much argument about whether this is any good as a piece of writing. It's called by some scholars a uh, trifle. I have held this book here up before one of the one of the editions I'm using and the editor of this particular Penguin Classics edition calls it a trifling thing or something like that. He uses the word trifle anyway. There is almost a consensus it seems amongst scholars that Sonnet 145 does not stand up to the quality of the other sonnets. It certainly stands alone in that it is the only one that is not written in iambic pentameter. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? But in the octosyllabic tetrameter, iambic tetrameter, it has four feet at eight at eight syllables. So it's different. It's completely different to any of the others. No, none of the other 154 sonnets does this. It also sits slightly weirdly in the middle of the Dark Lady sequence. Now we've talked a great deal about the Dark Lady. We don't really know who she is. We think that there's a good possibility. I've certainly come to come around to this more and more that the Dark Lady appears much earlier in the history that's playing out here than in the sequence in which they're published. They are published first the procreation sonnets which are me the poet admonishing the young man and urging him to have children, admonishing him for not having children, not getting married and urging him to have children. Then we have the fair youth sonnets where this whole beautiful relationship with the fair youth pans out and then we have the dark lady sonnets where we have this troubled, guilt-ridden, self-disgusted uh, relationship with the Dark Lady, which is very problematic in the way that I talk about her, in the way I talk to her, in the way I feel about her, in the way also that in the Dark Lady sonnets, as indeed in the Fair Youth sonnets, there is an overlap between the two relationships, and that's why I think they dovetail. And in the middle of all this, we have 145, which does not fit anywhere. Why does it not fit? Well, the tone is completely different to anything I say to the Dark Lady. It's clearly not addressed to the Fair Youth. There's no doubt about that. We don't need to really contemplate this as a possibility. There's a possibility that it's addressed to somebody completely different who we don't know about. There's an ultra-slim chance that this is actually a Dark Lady sonnet and that something has gone different. But hardly anybody, I think, really believes that because it doesn't fit. It doesn't fit with what goes before and it doesn't fit with what comes after. And, and we will see in a moment why. <laughs> and then there's a magnificent pun. <laughs> 
and people love this pun. This is the pun on the name Anne Hathaway, who is, of course, my wife in Stratford. I hate from Hathaway, from Hathaway, from Hathaway. I hate from Hathaway, I hate from Hathaway she threw. And saved my life saying not you. I embrace this possibility. We know how fond Shakespeare is of his punning and of his hidden little messages that fuse everything that are, that are found in everything. We know how much he loves putting his dexterity on this play. We know how much he drops hints without explaining them. That's what hints are after all. This is the art partly of sonneteering, surely. So I embrace, I like the idea very much. That this is a sonnet that is addressed not to my young lover, the beautiful young man who I'm having a relationship with over three or four years. It is not addressed to this lady who is sexually promiscuous, who is having an affair with my fair youth in front of my eyes, more or less, although behind my back, but I still know about it clearly, and, 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 and who, who disturbs me in her behaviour, even though I'm attracted to her, and I, 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 I call my eyes liars because they, because they tell me that she's beautiful when I know she's not. This is not a complex sonnet. This is one of the charges that have been levelled against this sonnet, that it's so simple, that it's so plain, that it's so so beautifully uncomplicated. Now who would you write a beautifully uncomplicated sonnet to? Well maybe to somebody who you are in love with in a beautiful uncomplicated way. We, we have to, we have to in order to understand William Shakespeare as a man, as a human being, discard the notion that he could only ever be in love with one person at the same time. We know this is not true. We know, he says, uh, he talks about his various loves in great detail. And it is not far-fetched to think that actually the love he has back in Stratford, no matter how he got into that, and there was a shotgun wedding, he was very young when they met and married, it's very possible that he was forced to marry her because she was pregnant with his child, but certainly you know, he was very young when they, when they married, and then very soon after they got married he left her behind. But he never actually left her, he, he goes back at the end of his career to live with his family, he keeps supporting them throughout, he keeps having affairs throughout, he keeps sleeping around, he keeps messing around, he keeps writing about other people, but he's a very loyal man somewhere in his heart. Not by our sort of post-Victorian, slightly weirded out standards that we have today, but by some measure he's loyal and steady and he keeps coming back and he returns there to Anne and makes over to her the second best bed, which is a, a wonderful detail in, in, in his will, uh, which is much, much talked about. But he certainly doesn't abandon her. He doesn't abandon children. Uh, he, he, he doesn't turn his back on Anne. Now, Anne is in Stratford. We know very little about her. We, we, we know she's from a, from, from a good farming family uh, and we know that we can assume that she's not entirely dim and stupid. And we can therefore also assume that somehow or other over these few years that I, the poet, have been gallivanting and writing and becoming successful over this time and also scandalous. We know this as well because this is in the sonnets as well. We, we, you remember we go by the words, we go by what we find in the words of the sonnet here only, nothing else. But we know that there has been scandal about me and the young man. We know that there has been scandal even, although we bracket, we don't actually know this from the sonnets, we know this from somewhere else, I think it gets referenced in the sonnets. But we know that there's been scandal about the young man and another woman, or rather the young man and a woman, uh, and Anne may well know about this. I mean, because you would, wouldn't you? Granted, it's not the age of the internet. Stratford is a three-day ride away from London. And Shakespeare does this regularly. But he also goes on tour. But work gets around. You'd have to be incomprehensibly naive uh, or, or, or idiotic to be married to a man like this and get to know him over the years and get to know of his travels and of his works and maybe read some of his works and not know 
entirely what's going on, or rather entirely not know what's going on. Maybe you don't know entirely what's going on, but, but to get to have an inkling of what's going on. And so I think this actually makes sense. It makes sense that it's written to Anne. It makes sense. Now, if I were to do this, if I, as a writer, were to write a poem to the person who most has reason to expect me to be faithful and loyal to them, but who knows full well that I'm not, and I have a very particular and a particularly valid and valuable relationship with them, and I write something to not actually, I don't think, appease them, but to say thank you for forgiving me for my many, many, many trespasses, for my many, many misdemeanors, for my philandering. I would probably choose a different format. I would probably make it clear in the format that this is a different thing. You're, it's, it's a different entity. It's not the same. It's not the same. I don't write to you in the same way as I write to other people. Why does it come across as naive, as, as simple, as a simple piece of writing? Well, it's a simpler relationship. It's a very simple relationship. It's a very young relationship that was entered into very young when it started. And then it just lasts because it's there. There's a family. There's a, there's a young wife who looks after the children. She's not sophisticated. We don't have reason to believe she's very sophisticated. But we also don't have reason to believe that I, the poet, don't love her. We don't have reason to believe that I disrespect her. And so I don't need complicated words to express this gratitude for her forgiveness. And this also does away maybe with the other explanation that's sometimes given that, that some people suggest that this sonnet sits before everything else. This, this was written way before everything else, when he was much younger, when he first met. Anne Hathaway. Now there was a, there was a, on TV. I can tell you there was a, there was a very well respected Shakespeare scholar, or I don't know whether he's a particular Shakespeare scholar. But he's certainly a scholar. He's certainly a TV uh, presenter who gets entire historical series to present. Who, in all seriousness, said that this is Shakespeare's first sonnet. This is the first time he writes the format, and he writes it to his young love in Stratford. There's no evidence of that. No, seriously, there's no evidence of that. This is pure conjecture. It could just be the case. It's extremely unlikely. And you know what I say? I say, because I keep saying it, in the absence of certainty, and there is no certainty, in the absence of certainty, likelihood is our friend. And it's extremely unlikely that as an 18-year-old, I, the poet, wrote this to Anne. What does she have to forgive me? Well, maybe that I made her pregnant is possible. It's possible. But I marry her, so and I, and I'm loyal to her for the first few months. I even stay there with her. I then go away, so it doesn't make sense as a young love, freshly in love poem. It, it doesn't, apart from the fact that it would sit way, way before I start writing the other side. So it would be in isolation. It's possible. It's not likely. If I write it to her after we've been married for a while, and maybe I've already given her uh, reason to hate me, that's possible, but then we are already in the territory of, well, when exactly do we date this, and, and, and we seriously don't know. So it's possible that it's an early work that refers to some reason that I, as the young husband, remember very young, very young, in my very late teens, early twenties, have given my slightly older wife by a few years. In Shakespearean days, in, in Elizabethan days, this would have been quite a significant age difference. Uh, for, for hating me, for my, my behaviour may have been bad. This is entirely possible. This is more likely. I think it's even more likely that this fits in chronologically approximately where we are, because remember, I think chronologically we are not after the fair youth story. I think we are in the Fair Youth story, which overlaps with the Dark Lady story. I think they dovetail. So there's a three to four year period during which all of this happens, and I think we are towards the end of that story, not quite in the middle, towards the end of it, when Anne, assuming that this is addressed to Anne, my wife, has had a lot to put up with and has put up with a lot and has after maybe quite literally saying to me, I hate you, 
you, you would forgive her, you would understand, you, you, you would be very, very much sympathetic towards her emotion if she'd at one point said to me, I, I hate you for what you're doing. And you would also understand that she would forgive him. He's William Shakespeare. I mean, I don't, who, how do we know what he was like as a, as a person, as a man? But he's William Shakespeare. He writes about human beings in a way nobody else has written about human beings. He understands human nature in a way nobody else understands human nature. Uh, and he writes the most gorgeous poetry in the world, in the English language, certainly. You would forgive him. I would forgive him. I think she does. This sonnet seems to suggest she does. So what does it mean? Sonnet 145. Those lips that love's own hand did make breathed forth the sound that said, I hate. I've told you this is a simple sonnet, and it is. It's not difficult to understand. Those lips that love's own hand did make, love's own hand, the hand of love. So she's a lovely woman. She's a beautiful woman, and she's a lovely woman. Love made those lips. And that's also to suggest, of course, that those lips that love made would normally speak words of love. And yet these lips that love's own hand did make, they breathed forth the sound, I hate. Now, I love the fact that I say, breathed forth. This does not sound to me like a hysterical woman screaming at the top of her voice, I hate you, I hate you, and throwing things. This sounds like a, a profound sense of despair or a profound sense of disappointment and disillusionment. I hate you. Do you see what I mean? This is subtle. Uh, it's not complicated, but it's subtle and it's very human. Of course it is. It's Shakespeare. To me, breathed forth the sound that said, I hate, to me, that languished for her sake. Now, languished to us has quite a different meaning or certainly doesn't have the meaning of I languished for your sake. We would not understand to mean I love you, I pine for you or I love you. In Shakespeare's days it does. Here it's understood to mean to me that languished for her sake I who loved her. But when she saw my woeful state, when she saw what a woeful condition I am, either because of the love and the genuineness of my love or possibly also because of the other things that have happened or been happening to me and that I brought upon myself through my own behaviour. The woeful state I'm in, straight in her heart did mercy come. It doesn't need translating. Her heart was immediately filled with mercy. Chiding that tongue that ever sweet was used in giving gentle doom, the mercy now chides the tongue that gave me ever sweet. Even when she's giving me doom, she does so in a sweet way. She does so in a, in, 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 in a gentle way. She was giving me gentle doom. And mercy is now chiding that tongue that gave me this gentle doom and taught it thus anew to greet. Mercy taught that tongue which had been giving me gentle doom, although it did so ever sweet, to greet anew, to use different words, to greet me in a different way. Mercy taught her tongue to do that. I hate, she altered with an end, that followed it as gentle day doth follow night. Gentle day follows night. We have at one point remarked on how dark and sometimes long and cold and lonely and dangerous and despair making nights can be in Elizabethan England, especially in the countryside. The day when it comes, especially if it's a, a spring, like a warm day, or a summer day, or a spring day, is a beautiful thing. It's a gentle thing compared to the harshness of the night. So like a gentle, redeeming, merciful day, 
that follows night, who like a fiend from hand to hell is flown away, is chased away here. Flown away here means chased away, like a fiend, like a devil, like a bad spirit. Remember, 144 talks about a good spirit and a bad spirit. Maybe this is why this is placed here. Whether it was written at this point, we don't know, but maybe that's why it's placed here, because it seems to reference the good spirit, bad spirit, duality of the previous sonnet. From hand to hell is flown away. And then how did you do it? How, how did you do it? I hate from hate away she threw. The meaning of I hate is thrown away from I hate. And saved my life and saved my life, saying, not you. The new ending is, not you. I hate, not you. And this saves my life. Now, I caution against reading too much into anything especially these sonnets, and we've been talking about these sonnets for a long, long time now. 154, this is 145, but we've read and posted to YouTube now. 154, all of them, all of them. But the line, and saved my life, I'm not sure this is hyperbolic. I'm not sure this is mm, too metaphorical. Maybe it's a little bit metaphorical. But I think, to me, it would make sense if there were some truth in this. I think that this is a very honest sonnet. You know that I think these sonnets are very honest anyway. I think they are the most honest expression we have of Shakespeare as a man. And I think this is no exception. I don't think this is trifling. I don't think it's banal. I don't think it's lacking in merit. Maybe it's not as dexterous, maybe it's not as flamboyant, maybe it's not as complex emotionally as some of the others, and it's deliberately, clearly, deliberately written in a different format. And I don't think this is a coincidence. This is not William Shakespeare forgetting for a moment that he's meant to be writing in iambic pentameters. Please, you're talking about a professional writer here who earns a living writing iambic pentameter music. He, he knows what it sounds and looks like. He has it in his blood. He could probably extemporate, he could probably improvise in iambic pentameter and, 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 and go through a week's conversations in iambic pentameter if he needed to. This is not a coincidence and it's not a mistake. Really, it isn't. It just is not a mistake. I don't think it's an early work. It could be. I, I, I have no proof for saying it is not an early work. I think it fits quite well where it sits. If I, William Shakespeare the poet, have been through everything, everything that the sonnets suggest I have been through and have gone through and have made other people go through, then my wife, Anne, would have good reason to breathe the words I hate. And she would still have reason, I think, to say, not you. I don't really hate you. I hate maybe what's happened and how you behave, but I don't hate you. You're the father of my children. You, 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 you are, after all, still my husband, and you're not, in essence, a bad man, is, I think, what this sonnet is about. And I think that's all this sonnet is about. I don't think it really asks any further questions. I don't think it's complicated, I don't think it's difficult, I don't think it's problematical. It's a plain sonnet, maybe. It's a simple, honest declaration of both love and gratitude. You saved my life. Because if my wife says to me, at that point, I don't hate you. No, you are still at home here. I, you, are, you still have a place in my heart, in, my, in our house then that could well be the refuge and the rescue that I need at that point. It, in, in an almost literal way, in an almost practical literal way. Certainly in an emotional way. And that's it. It's the end of the series. That's Saturday Sonnet. Uh, there's a coda to this a little bit, I think just for the sake of completion. 
I will tell you briefly what the other few sonnets at the end in the last week. You know, I've been doing this week by week, and there was a long gap. And so I'm timing this now so that this very last episode can come out, not on a Saturday, but on a Sunday, on Sunday, 23rd of April 2017, which happens to be the 453rd birthday and also the 401st anniversary of the death of William Shakespeare not going into the detail about whether it was his actual birthday then or not, just the official birthday that we celebrate on the 23rd of April. I put this sonnet at the end because it stands alone, there is no parallel to it. It really fits as a singular piece addressed to the love everybody is apt to forget, my wife and the mother of my children, who, who I spent the rest of my life with, after all. Everything else notwithstanding, I spent the rest of my life with her. And that's why I think it merits being here at the end as the final sonnet in this series. And briefly, before I go, I will tell you what the others are about. But really, really briefly, because I think that's kind of it. Like, I think I can knock this on his head now here. We have got to, two loves I have of comfort and despair. And, and, and the, the salaciousness, the outrageousness of this. Followed by 145, those lips that love's own hand did make. And they saved my life by saying, I hate not you. And then we have uh, 146, which is actually slightly problematical because there are two words or three possibly, or some syllables missing there. Uh, 146. Then 147, my love is as a fever longing still for that which longer nurses the disease. I talk about being diseased. I talk about this, this conflictedness, this feeling ill, feeling sick, feeling disgusted with myself. Now it comes back up again and a lot. O oh me, 148, woe me, what eyes had love put in my head which have no correspondence with true sight? Or if they have, where is my judgment fled that senses falsely what they see aright? I admonish my own eyes for telling me that you, the dark lady, but back onto the dark lady now, are fair when you're not. I, I have a distorted worldview, I have a distorted view of love and reality, and I hate myself for this to quite an extent. This is, um, like 147, for I have sworn thee fair and thought thee bright, who art as black as hell and dark as night. These are not good things, I say, to, directly to my dark lady. Even though I clearly fancy, I clearly, clearly need her sexually, still, my whole relationship and attraction to, and sexual relationship with the fair youth notwithstanding, I still need this as well, obviously. O cunning love, with tears thou keep'st me blind, lest eyes while seeing thy foul faults should find. Foul faults in the dark lady. Then canst thou, O cruel, say I love thee not, when I against myself with thee partake, against myself, against my better judgment, I with thee partake, I am with you, I sleep with you, I have sex with you, against myself. Oh, from what power hast thou this powerful might, with insufficiency my heart to sway, with your insufficiency, with your insufficient charm, <laughs> the insufficient qualities, with, with being not worthy of me, and yet still you sway me, you still win me over. How, where do you get that power from? It can only be a dark, bad power. Who taught thee how to make me love thee more, the more I hear and see just cause of hate? Do you see how conflict, do you see how, how, how weird in a way this is? I, I keep talking directly to a woman, after all, who I'm having sex with, and I hate myself for it. I berate myself for doing so. Very different tone to, to, to what happened with the fair youth and completely different to what just now happened in relation to Anne Hathaway. And then one more, which is really, really interesting, and I could go on about this for quite a while, but I won't. 151, love is too young to know what conscience is. I think this I think this sonnet 151 is not addressed to the dark lady. I think it's addressed to the fair youth again. Then, gentle cheater, urge not my amiss, lest guilty of my faults thy sweet self prove. Because remember, they have a triangular relationship. The fair youth also has a relationship with the dark lady. I have berated the dark lady for this. I have been in despair over this towards him, the fair youth. And I think this, if you read this, 
sounds to me absolutely like it is written to the fair youth about his chiding me for being unfaithful to him when in fact he's doing the same. And then this wonderfully punning and with double meaning infused bit at the end where I say, but rising at thy name, rising at thy name, this is uh, more than one meaning I can tell you, rising at thy name doth point out thee as his triumphant prize. This is to the fair youth. The triumphant prize is the fair youth. Proud of this pride, he is contented thy poor drudge to be. I am your poor drudge. To stand in thy affairs, fall by thy side. I stand in thy affairs, I do your affairs for you. In other words, I'm sleeping with her on your behalf. No want of conscience hold it that I call her love, for whose dear love I rise and fall. I call her love for whose dear love you are her dear love, apparently, she seems to claim. And for that person, for the dear love, I rise and fall. Make of it what you will. And then, then the last one of the sonnets are addressed to anybody, 152. In loving thee, thou knowest I am forsworn. I think this is back. I think we're back on the Dark Lady. By the way, this is, this is, I, 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 I don't think this is generally accepted uh, wisdom that 151 is addressed to the fair youth. Uh, you, 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 you probably better check other sources to see what they say. I may be completely wrong, but to me that would make sense. Uh, to me, if you read 151 as being addressed to the fair youth, because they dovetail, because they happen simultaneously, not in sequence, then that would make a lot of sense. It's conjecture. I, I, I confess this is pure conjecture nearly pure conjecture, it's taken from the words. <laughs> 152, in loving thee thou knowest I am forsworn, but thou art twice forsworn to me, love swearing. This is about the breaking of oaths, and, and, and I accuse you of breaking oaths, uh, apparently to some husband possibly. This is possible that the Dark Lady was married, that, that there are several candidates for the Dark Lady, we haven't really gone into that because the evidence is so thin on the ground, but one of them certainly is married. And then I say, well, I break vows left, right and centre all the time, I break 20 vows. So it's again, it's guilt, it's guilt and kind of a profound unhappiness about the way things are really. This, these are not happy love poems, these are very conflicted. And it ends on the line, for I have sworn thee fair, more perjured I, to swear against the truth, so foul a lie. Once again, I tell the dark lady straight out to her face that she is not fair, meaning she's not only darker skinned of a darker hue, but she's also not fair, as in beautiful, she's not beautiful. That's how charming I am when I talk to her. That's what it is. And then we have 153 and 154, which are completely different. They are two allegories of Cupid, who in, in, in some pictures you will see this uh, depicted with a torch, which is the torch that inflames hearts. You, you, you're probably more familiar with the one with, the, with, with Cupid as somebody who shoots arrows. But, but here he has a torch and he lays down and while he's asleep, one of Diane's or Diane's maids takes this torch and takes it to a, to a pond warms the water with it, and this water is, is meant to become a healing pool for people who are uh, ill, for men who are diseased with love, who are lovesick. And both sort of say more or, less, more or less the same thing, and they stand here at the end uh, telling this story of Cupid and how, while he's asleep, this virgin maid of Diane's takes the torch to, 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 to create this pool, and how this pool doesn't work for me. How uh, I am so, so in the thrall of my mistress, the Dark Lady, I speak about specifically, how I'm so in thrall of the mistress that even this pool cannot save and rescue and heal me. This brand she quenched in a cool well by which from love's fire to keep perpetual, growing a bath and healthful remedy for men diseased, but I, my mistress thrall, came there for cure, and this by that I prove. Love's fire heats water, water cools not love. But you know, as I know, that love is the power. 
I can't say see you next week. This is it. This is Saturday Sonnet done and dusted. Thank you for accompanying me on this journey. It's all out there on YouTube. You can watch and hear and listen to all of the ones that I've put on there. Other people have done similar things. If there's one hope I have, and only one hope, it is that I have done these sonnets a little bit of justice. You know I love them. And if I have trespassed against them, if I have made mistakes, if I have read them wrongly, interpreted them wrongly, if I've told you things that simply aren't the case, if I've confused or bored you, that would be the worst offence, actually, if I'd bored you. Uh, but, but if I've confused or bored you, if I, if I misled you, then please forgive me. I hope Will will forgive me uh, for approaching his work like this. Uh, for me, it's been tremendous. I love these songs. I could go on a lot longer, I can tell you, but this is it. Remember, love is the power and have a very good life.